At Accenture, we love UMD graduates. Um, this week, I asked our recruiting team to let me know how many UMD graduates we have working at Accenture, and they told me that we have over 400. And in fact, we've been recruiting from UMD for 10 years, and UMD is a really important campus for us. How many of you uh, know people who work at Accenture? And how many people have, uh, keep your hands up, how many of you have interviewed with Accenture or are planning to interview with Accenture or would like to interview with Accenture? All right, well, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get some more hands raised uh, before the end of the day today. To give you a sense of the, the scale and the scope and the reach of Accenture, we have about 4,000 employees in the D.C. area and about 280,000 employees worldwide. We operate in over 50 countries and we serve clients in over 120 countries. And we work in consulting, in technology, and in outsourcing, and we help our clients across all of the sectors you can imagine, from government to high tech to financial services. We help our clients drive high performance businesses and, and organizations. When Melissa asked me to share some thoughts with you this morning to kick off the sixth annual Social Enterprise Symposium, I immediately thought about my favorite exercise from Accenture's Leadership Development Program. LDP, as we fondly call it, is an annual six-month leadership training program that runs for 200 or more of our top senior managers from around the world to help us advance in our leadership journeys. The exercise that I want to share with you is called a teachable point of view, and the term comes from leadership guru Noel Tishi, who says that leaders can open minds and inspire and motivate people through teaching. But to be able to teach, you need to have a coherent set of values and ideas that are indeed inspiring and motivating and that can be put into action. So I'd like to share my thoughts with you and let you all be the judge. What I've learned on my 15-year journey with Accenture can be summed up really well by the title of my favorite children's book series. It's called Choose Your Own Adventure. How many of you read these books when you were when you were young, excellent, excellent. Well, you'll be happy to know that these bu books are very much still in publication. I checked this out this weekend in our neighborhood library in DC when I was um, looking for early readers for my six-year-old. I found a whole stack of the Choose Your Own Adventure books. They seem to have changed the covers, but it's still the same concept. Basically, you start reading the book, and then you choose what's going to happen. In the, in the book. You choose what page to go to, which adventure to take. So when you start the book, you don't know how it's going to end. My experience tells me that we all have the power to choose our own adventure in our careers and that the sooner that we start doing that, the sooner that we see ourselves in the driver's seat of our careers, the sooner that we will start enjoying the ride and I believe the more meaning and fulfillment that we'll find in our careers. So, if you want to choose your own adventure in your career, I would argue that there are five rules of the road that can help you do that. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk you through these five rules of the road. First rule of the road is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask for those things that are really important to you, that you care about that new promotion, that next project, that great opportunity, that raise. Don't be afraid to ask for things. If you ask for things, you're starting the process of opening a door for yourself, opening up a fork in the road. You may get things that you didn't even ask for, but at a minimum, you will start opening that path. This pattern of envisioning forks in the road and then going and asking for them has come up time and time again in my career. And even beforehand, uh, even beforehand, when I was accepted in 
the University of Pennsylvania as an undergrad, I asked if I could defer for a year uh, to study abroad. And when I went to graduate school, I wanted to study business and foreign policy, and I wanted to do that at, at Wharton and the Fletcher School. There were no programs connecting those two universities, but I was able to kind of to find a way that was important to me. But um, another example, a few years ago, well, I've always had the dream of living abroad uh, with my family. I think this is because when I was four years old, uh, my family moved to Paris. That's Paris, France, not Paris, Texas. Although we did later on live in Houston, Texas, but not to be confused. And anyways, a few years ago, when I started working on the global corporate citizenship team, I had this idea that as it was a global role and I had team members um, all across the world, that it would be a good opportunity to, uh, to live abroad and to live in the hometown uh, where my husband grew up in Bilbao, Spain. As it turned out, this Bilbao chapter was a great, uh, great professional move for me, which I didn't anticipate at the time. But by living in, in Europe and being close to our leadership team in London, I was able to forge much stronger relationships than, than I might have been able to do had I stayed in San Francisco with the huge time difference. And over the course of the time in Spain, I was able to evolve my role to become director of programs for corporate citizenship. So it was a, an opportunity to, um, to advance. Now, let me just define some terms here. Uh, corporate citizenship, what do we mean by that? Companies will use all kinds of terms and phrases to, to get at something similar. You might hear about social value creation. You might hear corporate citizenship. You might hear corporate social responsibility. You might hear sustainability. At Accenture, we have a global corporate citizenship program, and it covers four areas and that the dean shared with you a few moments ago. It covers our community investment program, where we have a signature program called Skills to Succeed, where Accenture's made a long-term goal of helping to equip a half a million people with the skills to get a job or to build a business by 2015. Corporate citizenship also includes our environment program. How do we grow Accenture in an environmentally sustainable way? Corporate citizenship also includes our transparency program. How do we talk about Accenture's non-financial results, our environmental impacts, our societal impacts, et cetera? And fourth, it's our network. How do we mobilize a team of a core team, our corporate citizenship core team, of which two of uh, my team members are actually here in the room. Hi, Dane. Hi, Jean. Please um, send your tough questions over to them. But I wanted to make sure there was a nice cheering section here. Uh, for me today, so thank you for, for coming out. That the, the network concept is how do we mobilize our core team and then our, our network of professionals. We have corporate citizenship professionals in each of the countries where we operate, organized around 15 regions, and we engage with other corporate functions from marketing to legal to finance and through our business units. How do we engage the whole uh, network around Accenture to deliver on the strategies and the goals that we set? So anyways, that's what we mean by, by corporate citizenship. Coming back to the five rules of the road. So we've talked about rule number one is don't be afraid to ask for things. Well, rule number two is before you ask, remember to listen, to listen carefully to your stakeholders and really know what they, what they value. The greatest leaders that I know Listen first. A good friend of mine just left Accenture and went over to USAID, and I had a chance to ask one of his direct reports recently how the transition was going. And he told me that what really impressed him about my friend was that when he started the job, when he just came into the job, he went on walkabout, and he went around and asked all the team members and all of his peers what they thought needed to happen to make a difference in this part of, of USAID. And he quickly turned that around into a strategy and a game plan going forward. But he listened first. This rule of the road about listening was really crystallized for me in a catalytic conversation that I had when I just came out of business school. It was in the year 2000, 
It was with a man named Steve who ran Accenture San Francisco office. And I can still vividly remember sitting with him and looking out at the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge, kind of peeking out above the fog in San Francisco. If you've seen the scene, like it's, it's unforgettable. So we're sitting there, and I wanted to ask him two things. I wanted to know if Steve could transfer my offer from Accenture from New York City, where I'd started with the company out of undergrad and worked for three years, and if he could transfer the offer from New York City to San Francisco Bay Area, where I really wanted to be living and working. And second of all, if he would give me six months of non-chargeable work to launch a social innovation program that I had in mind and that ultimately became New Sector Alliance that the dean uh, talked about a moment ago. So what really captured my attention with Steve was how he responded to my request. He didn't say yes, and he didn't say no. What he said was, well, what's the business case? For my two questions, he had three more questions for me. He wanted to know, first of all, what's the value proposition for our stakeholders, for our clients, for Accenture, for the community? He also wanted to know, why now? What was the burning platform to do all of this right, right then? And third of all, he wanted to know, why me? What was my unique value proposition and what would give him the confidence that I was the right person to take this, this bold idea and put it into action that time? So what Steve taught me was about really understanding what stakeholders value. When you're going out to pitch an idea, it's really, um, easy to be stuck in your own mind and to think about what am I trying to get here today? What are my objectives? But it turns out that the, the best way to actually get these things is to put your mind in the, you know, put yourself in the feet and the mind of the person that you're asking and to really understand what are their key decision points? What do they value? What do they think is important? This is a template that I've used time and time again since this conversation with Steve, and that's proven to be very effective as a change maker. Okay, so rule number two was before you ask, listen. Rule number three is about thinking who to ask, because if you're going to be a change maker and drive change in an organization, you're going to need to have champions. You're going to need to have well-placed and strong champions. So who you ask is really quite important. You can never know in advance exactly where your path is going to lead you. But I've always been a strong believer of trying your best at each stage and building strong relationships all along the way. Let me fill in some holes in my story to illustrate this. So, and as was shared, I've been with Accenture for 15 years. The first 10, I was in our strategy consulting practice, and the last five, I've been on the corporate citizenship team. During those 10 years, I spent about half of the time working on strategy consulting projects with clients across a number of sectors, driving strategies and performance management programs for those clients. But the other half of the time, I was launching these social innovation programs like uh, New Sector Alliance that I've just talked about, like our U.S. Eco Program that was born out of the Net Impact Green Challenge, and our con strategy uh, sustainability consulting practice that started right around the time of the Net Impact Green Challenge, and also a think tank that we created based upon a patented model of social ROI that we call public service value. So there was a number of these launching social innovation programs that happened during those, those 10 years. Then when I came back from uh, maternity leave, I was looking around for a new role and it turned out that there was a, a job posting for strategy lead for corporate citizenship. And the hiring manager, who's now my current supervisor, was a woman who I'd met actually throughout all of these different social innovation programs that I'd been uh, launching throughout the, the previous years. And so I always credit my daughter with, with uh, impe having impeccable timing because of being able to find this, this role like the week that I came back from maternity leave. 
But one of the contributing factors to my being able to get this role was that I had built a relationship with this um, woman who ran corporate citizenship over the preceding years without knowing where that, where that might lead. The chance to work in our corporate citizenship team was really important for me um, at the time because it gave me an opportunity to help us practice what we preach about sustainability to our clients and to really have an opportunity to have impact at a large scale, to have impact across the 280,000 plus employees at Accenture and the many communities where we work and live all around the world. Okay, so if the first three rules of the road um, are about seizing the opportunity, the fourth rule of the road is about choosing between all these new forks that you've now created for yourself and these different paths in the road. To choose between these different forks, it's important to find your north star and to let that north star be your guide. What's important to you? What do you most value? How do you define success? I've always defined professional success in two ways. One is about having an impact, and the second is about building new skills and growing as a, as a professional. In terms of having an impact, I've always wanted to have an impact on the society around me, starting with the circle in my family and my friends, and then moving out to my work, and then to the broader community. In terms of skills, and, and a, having a growth mindset. One thing I can share is that this kind of growth mindset is something that's very much encouraged at Accenture. Accenture is the kind of place where you have clear job roles from analyst to consultant to manager to senior manager, et cetera, et cetera. And at each level, there are clear promotion readiness criteria. Everyone has a career counselor who works with you um, each year to build out your career development plan and to help you through that path. And you receive a lot of structured feedback. Ask my team members, if, uh, if you come into Accenture without being very comfortable giving or receiving feedback, you will click quickly build that muscle for yourself because it's, it's an important part of continuing to grow and to learn as a professional. So each year, each stage in my career, I've always had really clear growth goals. I can remember when I first joined Accenture, coming out of a liberal arts undergraduate degree and out of work in politics and in the media, not knowing much at all about business. I was very focused as an analyst in terms of learning about financial analysis, how to do that in a rigorous way. That also really played into my decision to, uh, to go to Wharton Business School. I thought I could learn that there. My current growth goal in my role as director of programs for corporate citizenship is all about learning how to drive the change that, that we want to see. I started in the corporate citizenship team as our strategy lead, having come off of 10 years as a strategy consultant inside of Accenture. But I'm here to tell you that it's actually quite a different skill set to be the strategy person who comes up with these big ideas and these frameworks and these um, concepts and goals and objectives, and then being the person who's supposed to deliver and implement on these goals, particularly across a large, complex, multinational corporation. And so um, my growth goal right now is about learning how to be a delivery expert and how to really implement and drive the change that we want to see. And I'm learning about that more and more every day. Which brings me to the fifth and final rule of the road, you'll be happy to know. The fifth rule of the road is about opening up your window and your decision-making criteria in order to be able to empower and inspire other people. Going back to that first conversation with Steve, sitting in his office, looking out at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, many years later, I realized that Steve had given me not only key tools in my toolkit about how to be a change maker, how to ask for things, how to understand what stakeholders really value, and how to find the right champion in the organization, but he also 
taught me a much more profound leadership lesson about how to inspire other people. When Steve asked me to get out of my head and to get into his head, he was also telling me what was important to him. He was giving me a template or the decision-making criteria that, that he found most valuable. And by sharing that with me, he was giving me the opportunity and to innovate and to find a way to, to meet all of these different um, objectives. This allows you to kind of unleash the power of other people. I've tried to do this on a number of occasions. For example, um, on my corporate citizenship team, I had two managers, who, or two consultants, who were really gunning for promotion to manager. I laid out for them three clear promotion readiness criteria that, uh, that they could demonstrate in order to show that they were ready to become a manager. Things like being able to see around corners and to escalate and to raise issues before they come a problem. Being able to manage projects end to end. And we laid out key projects throughout the year and opportunities where they could start to demonstrate these, these uh, capabilities and build out these capabilities. When these two team members became a manager, they were really excited to have that new title. But I believe that they knew in their heart of hearts that they were already acting like a manager and that they'd already really benefited from the journey that they'd been on and that we'd been on together in terms of building out these new, these new muscles. So if you can articulate what success looks like for you, you can empower your teams to, to embody those principles and you can also empower people to come up with solutions and ways of working that you may never have even imagined yourself. Okay, to recap, I've talked about five rules of the road and as I rattle them off and remind you what they are, I'd be really interested to see you either raise your hand or put into the, um, the cue box which of these five rules of the road resonate with you and are something that you think you could put into practice tomorrow. So rule number one, don't be afraid to ask. Anybody? Excellent. Rule number two, before you ask, listen. Excellent, good. Rule number three, when you ask, pick your champions very carefully. Think about who you're going to ask. Number four, find your North Star. Understand what's most important to you and let that be your guide as you navigate through your path. Excellent. And number five, be transparent about what's most important to you to be able to inspire your teams to, to um, empower and innovate. Great. Well, in summary, my perspective is that our careers are journeys. They're a marathon and not a sprint. And the sooner that we treat our journeys like a choose your own adventure novel, where we're in the driver's seat, the sooner that we will enjoy the ride, and I believe the more likely we will be to find fulfillment and meaning along the way. Thank you for listening to these reflections here today. I hope that some of them resonated and are meaningful to you, and I really look forward to hearing your questions and the ideas that this may have sparked. You've been with Accenture for 15 years, and I'm sure you've seen quite a lot of changes. And it would be excellent if you could tell the students a little bit over that time, how has the pace of change uh, increased with respect to Accenture's focus areas around sustainability and creating internal practices that reflect what you're actually working with clients on? Great. Well, the corporate citizenship journey that Accenture's been on has been um, an incredible journey as well. And we've launched our Skills to Succeed program a couple years ago. And that was as a result of our CEO asking us how we could really measure the impact that we were having in our communities. 
The time, the era before uh, Skills to Succeed, we, we like to call it the time of a thousand flowers blooming. Okay. <laughs> At this time, we had uh, community investments happening in each of our local offices in all possible different directions. And uh, our CEO at the time um, was clear that, that we were having an incredible impact in the communities, but he wanted us to be able to, to really measure that and to really be able to, to talk about that and to harness the power of Accenture. So we set off on a process to figure out where to focus. And we set in on this concept of, of skills to succeed because it was a very strategic issue for Accenture uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, skills to succeed gets at right at the heart of Accenture's core competency. So if you peel back the onion of a company like Accenture, you can see that at the core, we're really a talent management company or a human capital company. And so we wanted to be able to take that core competency that, that is shared among all of our employees all around the world and bring that into our communities. Second of all, uh, at Accenture, our talent is our greatest asset. And we wanted to have a program that could really showcase the talent of Accenture people um, through these Skills to Succeed programs where we have volunteering efforts happening, let's say job resume, um, interview skills, um, practice practicums happening with, uh, with nonprofit organizations all over the world. We also do pro bono consulting projects where our consultants help our nonprofit delivery partners build their capacity and, and have more of an impact. And um, finally, the Skills to Succeed program has become quite embedded into how we go to market and, and how we do business um, in each of our communities. All around the world, we've asked our corporate citizenship teams to take this concept of Skills to Succeed and the skills gap that, that exists in different countries and different economies and to look carefully at what are the high growth job sectors in those economies? What are the demographic populations that are particularly excluded from pathways into jobs in those sectors? And then where are the nonprofit organizations that are helping to bridge those gaps and build relationships with those organizations? So by doing that, we have a skills to succeed strategy that's quite localized in each of our, in each of our markets. So the journey that we've been on with skills to succeed is all about um, having a community investment program that's very strategic strategic for Accenture, that leverages our core competencies, that showcases our talent, and that's embedded into our local market um, strategies all around the world. Excellent. So I think building on that, we had a question from Deborah Blank about what are the strengths that you see in the millennial population at Accenture? Maybe as it ties into some of the work that you're doing. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, excuse me, we have a large number of millennial, uh, millennial generations working at Accenture, we're hiring right now about 60,000 people a year, and the large proportion of that is going to be young people um, coming out of school. We're seeing about six million resumes or something like that per year. So in terms of millennial skills, what I've seen and what I hear from, from recruits and from the surveys, the employee poll surveys that we do, is that um, Millennials want to work for a company that's committed to being a responsible corporate citizen. Millennials want to work for a company that's, that's having an impact, and they want to have an impact as well. And so um, this population really pushes us to be clear about articulating the impact that we can have and to make sure that these programs are um, right front and center. Excellent. Um, these are great questions coming in. You guys can see them on the board, so I'm going to try to pick a few, uh, Lisa. Uh, in the business case that you were describing yes. in your talk, uh, what were the key elements of that value proposition, and uh, what had the biggest impact? Great. Yeah, so we're back with Steve and the Golden Gate Bridge, <laughs> San Francisco. Um, the, the hills are calling us to go out and take a hike. So, so the, the concept was of New Sector Alliance, um, was a concept of having a a win-win um, strategy for each of the different stakeholders involved. Um, one of the stakeholders were students. So New Sector Alliance is actually a nonprofit consulting firm where students are the consultants, and Accenture's are the coaches, and the like the client relationship 
managers setting up projects with nonprofit consult with nonprofit organizations. Um, Accenture people would recruit students on campus. We started this at um, the GSB at Stanford Business School and at Harvard Business School. We would conduct strategy interviews um, and bring bring students in, and then coach them through these uh, nonprofit consulting. Um, projects with local nonprofits. So the different stakeholders were students, the business schools, and um, Accenture professionals, Accenture as a company, the nonprofit organizations. For each of those stakeholders, we thought about what's the value to them. So for the nonprofits, we thought the value is you have an opportunity to increase your capacity and capabilities and um, with a pro bono consulting project, which will drive more impact for your beneficiaries. For the business schools, we were offering, and for the students, we were offering on-the-job training for, for students. And for the students, we were giving um, course credit that was set up through the universities and um, a chance to, be, to gain on-the-job uh, experience and to be mentored and coached by Accenture professionals. And then, last but not least, for the Accenture professionals, this was an opportunity to really apply the skills that could have been built in the professional, in the commercial sector, um, and apply that into the nonprofit sector. This is highly motivating for, for our young people. We're just talking about the millennials who want to, to give back. It also gave um, our younger professionals an opportunity to have a stretch role. So you might have a consultant who's managing a team of students from um, Stanford Business School, and that, that's a stretch role um, for that consultant. So the value proposition here was we tried to think about each stakeholder group and what would be the value to them and make sure that, that the concept really had a clear value proposition to each stakeholder. That's excellent. And for the students, I want to just take a minute because we run a very similar program here at the university called Change the World. And we work with professional consultants and nonprofits on consulting programs, both for credit and volunteer. Um, students across campus can apply for that program every fall and spring semester to use their skills in the community. That's um, so that's excellent. You were really a change leader, I think, in creating that model that many yeah, universities have 2001. adopted. Yep. 2001, right. We launched in 2006. So that's excellent. Um, so here's a really great question, more of a personal question for okay. you. Great. Uh, if you could share uh, with the audience who has been a consistent North Star for you, if there's a public figure or a mentor um, over the years and why? Well, I'll just take the personal question and, and make it very personal. I'm going to go right to my grandmother. I actually tested out this um, presentation today with her yesterday uh, before, before I shared it with you all, and she, she was very proud. <laughs> but um, she's the kind of woman who's just always had a strong, uh, strong value system and who's always given me sort of the courage to, to stand up and to have a voice. She was a woman who was on her speech and debate club when she was in high school and college and I think got a scholarship through that. And so anyway, somebody who's always mm -hmm. encouraged me to, to have a voice, to stand up, to be heard and, and things like that. And I think that's influenced me from a very early age. So there you go. That's excellent, excellent. Um, is there a specific example you could share of a project um, at Accenture, maybe around uh, some of the sustainability initiatives that the company has done that really embody this idea of bridging your business and your key stakeholders with trying to create or co-create economic, social, and environmental value. Yes. So I'd like to, uh, to share a Skills to Succeed story. And, and hopefully after I do, maybe we could see the Skills to Succeed video. Great. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Perfect. So this um, Accenture Skills to Succeed program, which I've, which I've referenced, is a program where we're investing um, around $40 million a year into our communities. And there are you know, just hundreds of examples of of uh, investments that we're making that, that reflect mm -hmm. on these um, characteristics. But one that I'll point out is happening in Madrid, Spain, where our teams have created a collective impact circle. And they've said, we know that the unemployment rates are exceptionally high in Spain, and they're even higher for the most vulnerable people in society, for, um, for people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And they said, what can we do about that? 
And our team in Spain has been doing nonprofit consulting in the community for 10 years at least and has a strong um, Accenture Foundation there and has really strong relationships in the, in the community. So what they did was they brought together all the different actors um, from the, the society in Spain. Many nonprofit consulting firms that are working in the skills, jobs, entrepreneurship space. Many of our clients, some of the largest um, corporations in Spain that have foundations that are also working in this space, whether they're in the, the um, telecommunications sector or the hospitality sector, and also government entities from the local government, from the Madrid government, from the national government, from the regional governments, and, and many partners from Accenture. And we've kind of rolled up our sleeves and said, how are we going to tackle this problem? And the group came up with a number of, of possible solutions around changing laws to make it easier to start new businesses in Spain, um, around creating a, a better job matching system, around um, identifying the skills that are needed and the competencies that are needed to move into certain sectors in terms of entry level jobs and having the nonprofit sector agree to use that competency model to build the job training programs that they're launching. So we came up with a number of solutions and um, we are running this collective impact circle. Uh, Accenture is the backbone organization, essentially the convener across 80 or more organizations in, in Spanish society and we're, where we're trying together to, to make a dent in this you know, massive problem and to bring the best of the private sector and the best of Accenture um, to bear in trying to make a dent in this problem. And so with that, if we could all thank Lisa for her time and her wisdom this morning. Thank you.